Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in um, again for our Bible study. We are finishing up the last of the pre-exilic prophets. Now, um, due to the birth of my son last week, we had to skip Bible study. Uh, we will have a couple that we will miss um, just due to the ongoing nature of caring for a child. Uh, and also caring for mom as well. So just wanted to make sure that you were aware. I do thank you for all your call, your text, your prayers, uh, all of the gifts that everyone has purchased, the love that you've shown and shared. I appreciate it all. I just thank you for everything that you've done. I never wanted to a day to go by without me telling you thank you and how much I truly appreciate you as a congregation, as a church, uh, for all of the love that you've bestowed upon me. Uh, and my family as well. So just want to thank you for that. Now, we'll go through the last, again, of the pre-exilic prophets. We've basically touched on all of them except for these four or five. Uh, we also uh, kind of went a little ahead of ourselves. We're talking about Lamentations because that's going to be an exilic prophet. But we'll talk about those um, next week or the following week and get into each one of those chapters as well. So let us pray before we get started. We always always want to pray. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now to say thank you for everything that you've done, Father. We ask that you just continue to be with us, Father God, the Morning Story Missionary Baptist Church as we continue to learn your word, to grow in your word, Father, and to continue to serve your people, Father. Just guide us through and be with us in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. So. We'll start with uh, Obadiah. So what we'll go through is Obadiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, uh, and Zephaniah. That would be the last of our exilic, uh, or excuse me, last of our pre-exilic prophets. So that's before they were in exile. So this is all of it leading up to. Then we'll get to the exilic prophets. So that's going to discuss those prophets who were writing or who were speaking during the time of them actually being in exile. Um, and then we'll get to the post-exilic prophets, which where we will land and uh, finish up with the book of Malachi, which was that last written one. And then there was 400 years of silence, which we'll discuss what happened also in between that time, because although it was silence, of course, that silence from God, there was still activities that were taking place. So we will get to that point and discuss a lot of that, because that transition from Malachi to the Gospels, it's lost in our biblical text. However, uh, we do understand everything that was kind of going on because of other uh, antiquities, other writers at the times who uh, were great historians that recorded this information. So let us go ahead and get started tonight. Uh, we're looking in the book of Obadiah first. So the book of Obadiah, like Jonah and Nahum, it predicts God's retribution or judgment on the nations. Uh, Obadiah may be the earliest of the 17 prophets writing his time of writing is argued because the short text gives no historical reference to confirm the date so when we think about that we often see uh, from our other writers that they were write uh, very specifically about the dates right so they would say something like uh, in the time of King Nebuchadnezzar, the 14th year of his reign or whatever something like that will give you an idea of when this happened in Obadiah, part of the, the issue with the book is it's really short and there's no historical references. So there is no way to pinpoint when it was written, no way to exactly confirm it. Um, but there are some of the, the, the text that's in it, some of the happenings that's going on in the book that makes it appear that it was written earlier than the other ones. Um, and we'll get into deep dive and that kind of stuff like that at a later date, but just kind of pointing out those different pieces as far as to the historicity of the book. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into this. The name Obadiah, right? So Obadiah means worshiper or servant of Jehovah. It is the shortest book in the Old Testament, and, it, and the prophecy is about Petra and Edom. When we look at Obadiah, uh, again, it's very, very short. As a matter of fact, it's only one chapter. So you won't see a Obadiah chapter one verse this. It's just going to say the verses because it's only one chapter. So when we look at Obadiah, verse one tells us that the vision of Obadiah, this is what the sovereign Lord says about Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy was sent to the nations to say, rise, let us go against her for battle. Now, 
Again, we see the starting off saying the vision of Obadiah. This is what the sovereign Lord says about Edom. This is telling us again that this is a prophetic message. This is giving the Obadiah and a vision from God. And this is telling him what he needs to communicate in his text, in his writing. Uh, so verse one gives us the prophetic indication by stating that this is the sovereign Lord says about Edom. Edom was a well-established, uh, but was told that they would be made small and be despised due to their pride of their heart and crimes committed against a brother nation. Now, when we think about that, right, our pride of our heart is something that usually gets in our way. It's usually the difference between a person receiving help and a person going off the deep end. Because the pride in our heart, we don't allow ourselves to be seen as vulnerable. We don't allow ourselves to be seen as down. We see ourselves as too big. We see ourselves as this grand person. But in reality, a lot of us are sinking. A lot of us are suffering. And pride of the heart is damaging uh, not only to you, but to the others around you. A lot of times when we have so much pride, we don't allow ourselves to be realistic. We don't allow ourselves to be real with God. We don't allow ourselves to be real with people. So people look at you and they can't relate to you because there is this, this separation of this, this false character that you've created. Uh, some people feel like, oh man, this person here got it all together when in reality that person is drowning. But the pride in their heart doesn't allow them to then be able to say, hey, I'm really not doing good. I need help. So what happens is they begin to die internally and then they get to the challenging part of is God really here for me? Does he really care? Well, yeah, but you have to call on the name. You have to go for help. If he's putting all these people around you, you have to stop pushing them away because of your pride and receive it. But this dealing with pride was slightly different here when it's talking about the pride of heart. And I'll tell y'all what it is. Let's go to verse number six. Uh, verse six, it talks about how to hidden treasures. Now, what has happened here, and, and we'll talk about and bring it all together about where they're talking about the pride of the heart came from. But let's go to verse six. It talks about this, this hidden treasure that was pillaged. Uh, it says, see, verse three, see, I will make you small among the nations, which we just read. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You live in the clefts of the rocks. So the clefts of the rocks, um, that clause, that's, that, that's talking about of Sela. S-E-L-A. So that's what the cleft of the rocks are. And make your home on the heights. You who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground, though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars from where I will bring you, declares the Lord. If these can, if thieves came to you, if robbers in the night or what a disaster, oh, what a disaster awaits you. Would they not steal only as much as they wanted if grape pickers came to you? Would they not leave a few grapes? But how Esau will be ransacked. This is what he's saying here. This is how they'll be ransacked. His hidden treasures pillaged. Where it talks about his hidden treasures being pillaged. Um, the ancient Greek historian by the name of Diodorus um, Succulus indicated that the Edomites put their wealth, which they accumulated this wealth from trade. They put it in vaults in the rocks. So when it's talking about the hidden treasures, this is the reference that it's talking about. Diodora Seculus, he basically um, pointed out that they took their treasures and they were hiding inside of the rock. So God is saying here, even all of your hidden treasures will be pillaged. So what they think that they're hiding away from the enemy and hiding away, well, even that will be pillaged. This is the judgment that God is talking about on them. Now, Let's keep it going. Let's keep it going. Uh, all your allies will force you to the border. Your friends will deceive and overpower you. Those who eat your bread will set up a trap for you, but you will not detect it. In that day, declares the Lord, will I not destroy the wise men of Edom, those of us understanding in the mountains of Esau. Your warriors, Teman, Teman will be terrified and everyone in Esau's mountains will cut down in the slaughter. Now, this is where we get to the understanding here is in verse 10 through 16, because this is this is the theme of the Edomites rejoice when Jerusalem fell. So basically they were rejoicing at somebody else's failure. They were celebrating somebody else's failure. That's a big no, no. Right. Because we learn something as, as, as Christians. We learn that as a believer of Christ, when a person is down, 
The only way that we are looking down on them is to pull them up. We're not looking down on them to talk about them, to shun them, to glorify that they've fallen. None of that, right? So when we look in Obadiah, we find out that this is what God is essentially punishing them for. Verse 10 says, because of the violence against your brother Jacob. So this was the brother nation we're talking about. You will be covered with shame. You will be destroyed forever. On the day you stood aloof. Uh, while strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like no one of them. You should not gloat over your brother in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. You should not march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster, nor gloat over them in their calamity in the day of their disaster nor seize their wealth in the day of their disaster. You should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives, not hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. That is the theme of this text. See, what happened is we find out in Psalms 137 and 7 uh, that they were screaming out, tear it down, tear it down. They cried and to tear down the foundation. So while this brother nation was being attacked, they were rooting on the attack. They were excited about it, saying, tear it down, tear it down. But this was retribution for the wrong they did to their brother nation. They were going to suffer and they were going to suffer and drink the drink of punishment. So that is what Obadiah is about. Obadiah is this prophecy about Petra and Edom for their, their, um, prideful heart. So that's a really quick book to read. If you ever want to just, you know, go through it yourself just to get an understanding uh, of what's going on here. But the, the, the theme behind it is that it teaches us that there's no room to gloat. We don't have room, opportunity, permission to gloat about what we have and to talk down about what other people because one thing that we got to understand, and this COVID-19 thing going to be showing a lot of people a lot of things, you can be up one day and down the next. It's very quick. It can happen to you very quickly. So you have to be very careful about how you handle the situations of when you're at the top. When you're at the top, the goal is not to be at the top and look down at everybody else, but the goal is to be at the top and try to help as many as you can. Now, Truthfully, you cannot help everybody. Some people will not want your help and you won't have the resources a lot of times to help everybody, but you help as many people as you can. Never looking down at them because you have to remember one thing. We all come from a low place, regardless of how you look at it. We've all seen a low place in our life. And when we've seen that low place, when we've seen that that bottom floor, when you're at the bottom, you're looking to the ceiling. And when you're looking to the ceiling, you're looking for the potential of help coming from it. So somebody ought to be out there to help you and pull you up. Of course, God is there, but God puts us in places to help others. And we have to make sure that we are prepared and willing to help others versus talking about them. So that's the lesson that we get out of Obadiah. Then we go on to Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. So we'll start with Nahum. Let me get there. Right, get right over to Nahum. Nahum is going to be right after Micah, uh, and that's where we'll get. So I'll read this here that's in my study Bible before we get into these three books because you'll kind of see how they are bridged together. The prophetic ministries of Micah and Isaiah were followed by a dark period in Judah. Hezekiah was succeeded by his wicked son Manasseh, who reigned for 55 years. For most of his reign, he was a comfortable vassal to the Assyrians. The historical books of the Old Testament portray his apostasy as he set up worship of Baal and Asherah in the temple. Toward the end of his reign, as the Assyrian Empire began to reach its final stages and the Babylonian Empire prepared to arise, another round of prophets emerged. Nahum's oracle of judgment on the Assyrian capital of Nineveh can logically be place between 645 BC and 620 BC, when Manasseh toward the end of his reign decided to rebel against the Assyrians. Nahum prophesied the fall of Nineveh a century after their reprieve in the time of Jonah, which could have encouraged Manasseh to ally himself with the Babylonian revolt against Assyria in 652 BC, but the time for the fall of Nineveh had not come yet. 
The revolt failed and Manasseh was disciplined by the Assyrians. They whose prophecy was fulfilled a generation later in 612 BC. Habakkuk focused on a central issue, God's justice in dealing with nations. The book opens with a limit. Why did God tolerate injustice in his people? We'll get into that. The Lord's answer was an oracle of judgment against Judah at the hands of the Babylonians. The astonishing fact that the invaders would be Babylonians rather than Assyrians suggests that Babylonians were not yet an obvious threat, thus placing the book logically between 605 and 588 B.C. God's answer perplexed Habakkuk as he could not understand how God's justice could be satisfied by punishing Judah using a nation even more wicked. A second oracle indicated that the Babylonians too would be punished in due course. The book closes with a prayer of submission to God's plan. The third prophet of the period child was Zephaniah, which we'll finish up, called for the kind of reform that Josiah enacted in 622 BC, therefore placing his prophecies a few years prior to that reform. Zephaniah proclaimed the coming of the day of the Lord, which would bring judgment on Judah. The day of the Lord is a time when the current state of affairs will be replaced with the Lord's intended order, a time of justice and covenant fulfillment. So when we see that the day of the Lord, that is what it's talking about. A time when the current state of affairs will be replaced by the Lord's intended order, a time of justice and covenant fulfillment. When we talk about right now, the, the state that we're in, we are not operating under God's design. So God's design wasn't to have uh, disease. It wasn't to have infection. It wasn't to have any problems, stress or strain. Uh, it was set up to be perfect. However, we made with our own free will an imperfect will. So when we look at everything that's going on right now, this is not God's design. We are now operating in a position where Satan is able to go in and manipulate everything. Even when we look down to our fruits, our vegetables, even those are not coming from the ground as they once were. They're coming with all kinds of chemicals, pesticides. You're seeing all kinds of hybrid fruits and everything else. So when you think about that, none of this is God's design. We're, what we're living in right now, none of this is the intended design. So as we get to really just diving into that, it says the day of the Lord, that will be the time when the Lord comes back and restores his, or restores his intended order, a time of justice and covenant fulfillment. The prophets drove home the point that covenant fulfillment included not only the covenant promises, but also the threat of curses for unfaithfulness. So when they were talking about this covenant fulfillment, there's two, two pieces here. This was coming with Jesus Christ. So that's when the covenant fulfillment would come. And then we would have the, the coming of Jesus Christ when he comes back and then everything is, is, is again changed. So that would be the next day of the Lord. This reference here is talking about the coming of Jesus Christ. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. We know that he's coming back. So when he comes back, that's when this order will be restored. That's when things will look a little differently. So this is talking about in the Old Testament context, the prophets drove home the point that covenant fulfillment included not only the covenant promises, but the threat of the curses for unfaithfulness. In anticipation of the day of the Lord, Zephaniah instructed the people to seek the Lord. He announced the time of restoration when the nations would be judged. Again, this is the upcoming piece here. So he's talking about something that's in the near future. That is something that we definitely have to pay attention to when we're dealing with Bible study, when we're dealing with understanding the Bible. Uh, a lot of the things that we're reading, especially in prophecy, has already occurred. So we're not waiting for any of this stuff to occur in 2020 and 2021. There are things that have not yet occurred yet, right? But those things we will see in later times, in later parts. So we definitely want to look at that Um from that context now let's get into nahum habakkuk and zephaniah right so nahum the name means consolation but his message was anything anything but that for the ninevites if we recall our study on jonah we remember that he didn't want to deliver the message to the ninevites and didn't want god to spare them so here we see that jonah gets what he wanted which was to see them perish although it did not happen until about 150 years after Nahum penned the book. So Jonah ends up getting what he, want, what he wants, um, although it didn't happen again about 150 years after Nahum had penned the book. 
when we look at the book of Nahum, right? So these three books are all three chapters each. So three books, nine chapters in total. Let's go through them and understand what each chapter uh, of these books are talking about. And then we'll be done. Uh, Y'all keep seeing me kind of looking back and stuff. I got a lot going on. So birthday party is going on today. Peace of man's coming, everything. So we're still recording because we still have to do God's work. So that's the beauty of it is that we are able just to continue life and continue to share the gospel regardless of everything that's going on right now. So that's always a beautiful thing to be able to do is just continue to share the gospel. So let us go ahead and get into Nahum. Now, Nahum in chapter one, it starts with describing the character of God, which Nahum puts in, uh, writes, writes it in a poetic flow, right? So when we look at verses one through seven, let's look and see what this says. Verses one through seven of Nahum says, a prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither and blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence. The world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. This is very poetic when it talks about discussing God and his character. Uh, after the character of God is discussed here, we see the second part of the first chapter focuses on the condemnation of Nineveh. Verse 8 states, uh, uh, it starts with an overwhelming flood. He will make an end of Nineveh. That's what that's what it says. It says, but with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. This what he's talking about. He wasn't talking about water. Right. But it was a symbolic for the invading army that they would flow in like rushing water. Um, he mentions trouble will not come a second time. This is because God never permitted the Assyrians a second victory over his people. The first came at the fall of Samaria. This was in like 722, 721 BC uh, in the northern kingdom of Israel. He commanded that he would get rid of them for good. So what we have to understand here is that when God allowed the Assyrians to overcome and to take over and to bring this trouble onto his people he didn't say he's going to continue to let them do it so he said it wouldn't happen again it wouldn't be a second time that's what we get out of chapter one chapter two it goes in and it beautifully paints the coming picture of the fall of Nineveh it was like a preview um, to a movie it explains the attack even to the point of them having their gold and silver plundered now as all of my people who attend Bible study at Morning Star Missionary Baptist Church, you know that when we're doing a survey, we're going to go over it. And then you go home and you study and you read it for yourself to see all of the action that's happening. But when we look at verse uh, or chapter two, this talks about Nineveh to fall. This is like getting a good trailer of a movie before you go see it. And you already know some of the good action points. That's what's happening in chapter two. As we get to chapter three, this was a woe to Nineveh. It was the judgment of Nineveh being justified. Let's read uh, verse one. And it starts off in chapter three says, woe to the city of blood full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. The crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses and jointing chariots, charging cavalry, flashing swords and glittering uh, spears, many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without numbers, people stumbling over the corpses, all because of the wanton lust 
of a prostitute, alluring the mistress of sorceries who enslaved nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. This was that judgment upon them. This is what's happening. When we get here, we see that God is furious with these people. He's, he's upset. Verse 10, uh, it goes and says, yet she was taken captive and went into exile. Her infants were dashed to pieces at every street corner. Lots were cast for her nobles and all great men were put in chains. This is describing all of the things that is occurring. The woe to Nineveh that will occur. But when we look at this part where it talks about being put in chains, this was a mimic to what the Assyrian kings often did to capture leaders. They would go and they would put them in chains. They would go and uh, capture the leaders. And, and one of the, the Assyrian kings, King uh, Ashurbanipal, Ashurbanipal, that name is something I can't get, A S H U R. B-A-N-I-P-A-L. He gave a description of his treatment of a captured leader. And in his treat in his description, he says that he put a dog chain on him and made him occupy a kennel at the eastern gate of Nineveh. So this was how the Assyrians treated leaders when they would capture them. So that's why you see this in verse 10. It gives this kind of this idea of reflection of what they've done is being done unto them. Now, the rest of the chapter basically tells them that their strength and riches can't save them from the judgment of God. That's the reality of it. We have a choice when it comes to what we do and how we do it. If we do what God tells us, then we tend to see things go a little bit better for us. Now, does that mean that there won't be any problems in our life? No. As a matter of fact, there will be problems. And the way that you handle those problems will also determine how good you vision life. So if you know God and have a relationship with God, when you go through problems, you will see the positive in it versus always seeing how you've been challenged or everything that's going wrong with it. So it helps you to fight a little bit and battle a little better. So let's get to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk had a message that was clear. God is holy and he can't look with approval on sin. That was Habakkuk's message. That was the, the, the clear message. Habakkuk was a Judean prophet with a priestly background. If you look at the three chapters, they deal with faith. So we'll see that uh, Habakkuk faith was tested. We see that there was faith taught and we see that there was faith triumphant. So his faith was tested in chapter one. He asked God to answer his cry about violence and corruption in the land. Habakkuk was upset because he felt that God seemed to condone cruelty and violence. The Lord answered. God replied to him that he was going to do something that Habakkuk wouldn't believe even if it were told to him. To the people of Judah, it was incredible that God would give them over to the arrogant Babylonians, the Chaldeans. Uh, let's go to verse 12 and, and just look at Habakkuk here. Verse 12 in chapter 1. It says, Lord, you. It says, Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You have made people like the fish in the sea, like the sea creature that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his uh, drag net. And so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his drag net. For by his net, he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. So this was Habakkuk complaining. Um, and God was saying, look, you won't even believe what, what I'm about to do. Like if I told you, you wouldn't believe it. We find out that now Habakkuk, after asking this question and talking about his complaints and giving his grievance here, he's in a state of waiting. Verse 1, I mean, chapter 2, it starts off with him waiting. So verse 1 shows Habakkuk waiting for a response. Verse 2 shows that the Lord is now replying. He says, 
Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation to make it plain on tablet so that the herald may run with it. This was God's message that the Babylonians will fall. So verse three is often thought to refer to the end of time. So let's look at this. Verse three says, for the revelation awaits in appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. A lot of times people associate this with the ends of time, but in this context, it's all actually referring to the end of the Babylonians. This was God's message that the Babylonians would fall and that it may be delayed, but the prophecy would be fulfilled. And we see that it was fulfilled in 539 BC. Habakkuk ended chapter two with woes. Now, when we're talking about God in his time, a lot of times we want to rush things, right? That's us. We want things right now, instantly, let, let, us ha let it happen. But the reality is, God's time is his time. We can't tell God when to do whatever. So he was saying, it may not come as fast as you want. It may seem delayed, but the prophecy will be fulfilled. Habakkuk continues and finishes with woes in chapter 2. He lamented that the sins of his woeful nation, particularly the sins of those who robbed the poor and spread violence throughout the land. That's what the woes were. And then in chapter 3, we see what we call faith triumphant. So the chapters show Habakkuk faith tested in chapter 1. You see, his faith is taught because God taught him a lesson in chapter 2. And in the last chapter, he gives a triumphant expression in the person of God who taught him. And you will see this in verse 18 and 19 because he ends this prayer with, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. That's what it ends with. So we went from him wondering and questioning and having complaints about how God was treating the people to God teaching him a lesson in chapter two to him now saying he's seeing his faith being triumphant and praising God saying, listen, I will rejoice in the Lord. Story of this is we have to let God be God. God is holy. He can't look with approval on sin. He's not approving people who's doing wrong um, to, to, to get blessings. He's not saying, oh, you did wrong, so yeah, I'm going to make sure everything you did is taken care of for you. No, that's not the kind of God that we serve. God is a forgiving God, but he can't just look on the sin. That's the reality of it. Now, let's get into Zephaniah, and we'll be done. Zephaniah means hidden by Jehovah. This book looks at the vindication of God. This judgment was on Judah and the Gentile nations. Again, we're dealing with three chapters here. Chapter one deals with Judah. So, in chapter one, you see the fury of God pours out in verses two and three. He says, I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away both man and beast. I will sweep away the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and the idols that cause the wicked to stumble. When I destroy all mankind on the face of earth, declares the Lord. That is when we get to see God pouring out his vengeance, his fury is coming out there. In verses four and six, he explains why he will do it. Uh, he says that I will stretch out my hands against Judah and against all who live in Jerusalem. I will destroy every remnant of Baal worship in this place. The very names of the idolatrous priests, those who bow down on the roofs to worship the story host, those who bow down and swear by the Lord and who also swear by Molik, Molik or Malchim is that name. Uh, when you look at those, those who turn back from the following Lord and neither seek the Lord nor inquire of him. What he is simply saying here is that he is going to punish them because of idolatry. They were focused on, on Baal and Malak and all these other gods, but they were not focused on the one and only true God. That was the reason he was upset. Verses 7 through 13, he explains whom it will fall on. So this is who he's talking about. He's talking about the officials, the princes, and the inhabitants of Judah. He then explains in chapter 1 how great the judgment will be. Now, verse 12 is where we see that. It says, at that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish those who are complacent, who are like wine left on his dregs, who think the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. Their wealth will be plundered, their houses demolished. Though they build houses, they will not live in them. Though they plant vineyards or vineyards, they will not drink the wine. The great day of the Lord is near. 
near and coming quickly. The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty warrior shouts his battle cry. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. I will bring such distress on all the people that they will grope about like those who are blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their entrails like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his jealousy, the whole earth will be consumed, for he will make sudden end of all who live on earth. This is the extent and how great the judgment will be. He's saying they money cannot buy them out of this punishment. There is nothing that they can do at this point to solidify themselves to or to move themselves away from the judgment that's coming. They've went too far. Chapter two. Chapter one dealt with the Ju or dealt with Judah. Chapter two deals with the Gentiles. Chapter two starts with the presentation of a time of repentance. So verse one through three, it says, gather together, gather yourself together, you shameful nation, before the decree takes effect and the day passes like with wind, wind blown chafe before the Lord's fierce anger comes up on you, before the day of the Lord's wrath comes up on you. See, this is three. This is where we get to the, the repentance part. He's telling them, he says, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. Verses 4 through 15 explains to us that the judgment on them is coming. When you see the reference here used as uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, or whenever you see the reference of Sodom and Gomorrah in the Old Testament, this meant total destruction at the hands of God. So when he compares the nation to Sodom and Gomorrah and talks about their destruction, be like that, that means there's going to be total destruction, meaning nothing left. When we look at verse 11, it tells us that the Lord will be awesome to them when he destroys all the goods of the earth. Distant nations will bow down to him, all of them in their own lands. This tells us of how awesome the judgment will be to them when he destroys all of the good of the earth. Stating distant nations will bow down to him in all of their own lands. This judgment on the Gentiles continued through chapter two and part of chapter three, if you're reading it. The second half of chapter three, though, after a discussion of judgment gives encouragement. And that's where we'll end. It says, this was the restoration of Israel remnant in verse nine through 20. It says, then I will purify the lips of the people that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve his shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, my scattered people, will bring me offerings. On that day, you, Jerusalem, will be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me because I will remove from you your arrogant boasters. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill, but I will leave within you the meek and humble. The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down and no one will make them afraid. Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm on that day. They will say to Jerusalem, do not fear Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord, your God, is with you. The mighty warrior who saves you or who saves he will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and reproach for you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the people of the earth when I restore your fortunes before their very eyes or before your very eyes. This was that promise. This was the restoration of Israel's remnant. So these are the end of our pre-exilic um, prophets. Now, next time we'll get into our 
exilic prophets, meaning the prophets that were doing the exile. Um, and when we discuss them, we'll have to break down a couple of the books because uh, one of them is rather long. So we'll break it down into two sessions. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that even through all of this, that they were going through all of this pain, all of this suffering, all of this turmoil, mm -hmm. rightfully, they deserved it. First of all, let's say that they deserved it, but God mm -hmm. still loved them enough to promise them to save them. And to make their name be praised in all the lands where they were once oppressed. That's the kind of God that we serve. When I hear people say things like, how can you serve a God that oppressed, you know, black people? The reality of it is, is that it wasn't God oppressing black people. It was people oppressing black people. But when we think about the reality of it is, too, is that just because somebody comes and they say that this is what the word of God says and then they try to utilize it against you doesn't mean that's truly what the word was intended for. That's the point of us reading our Bible and understanding our Bible is because we have to understand the Bible in its context. We have to understand even what slavery looked like in the Bible. We have to understand all of these different things that really are sore to us, especially as African-American community. But we got to understand it even more so because there is a lot of power in here. And even in the suffering that we went through in our individual life, God always brings us to a better place, to a triumphant place. But we have to trust and believe in him. So what I'm challenging everybody out there today who may not believe in God, who may not uh, have received him yet, is just take a moment and read his word. Pray. Ask for guidance. Ask for understanding. If you do believe in God, but you don't quite understand mm -hmm. all of this stuff about, you know, the Bible. I try to teach and make it as simplistic as possible, not to, um, you know, discourage intellect or act as if anybody can't understand it. But I try to make it plain so that people can really grasp the concept of a lot of it is repetition. A lot of it is really just understanding that, hey, we have to do right. If we don't do right, bad comes. And then the other piece is that sometimes even when we are doing right, bad comes because it's just part of life. It's like there is evil that's going to be around us, but God will not allow it to prevail against you or overcome you. He will either make you strong enough to withstand it or strong enough to overcome it. So just keep that in mind, man. I love y'all. I pray for y'all. And I hope that everybody is doing well doing this stay at home thing. Uh, looks like we just got to stand it a little farther, but either way, God will still get the praise and the glory at the end of this. Continue to pray. Continue to um, call one another to check on one another. Continue to watch your Bible study lessons. Continue to join in Sunday mornings. Continue to give. Continue to uh, go by the church if you're out there, you know, cleaning up the lawn or whatever. You know, just keep doing what you have to do. But most of all, continue to protect yourself. Be safe out there. I love you. God bless y'all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you just saying thank you. We know that your word, Father God, is to give us direction, Lord. It is to present you for who you are, and that's God and your characteristics for who you are. And that's a loving God, a caring God, but also a God that will not play around with us, Lord. We have to realize that we have to live this life and be serious about the things that we do. So give us strength as we continue to guide us on our way, Lord, and just walk with us day by day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I pray that everybody has a great night. Appreciate y'all getting ready to go celebrate baby girl's birthday. So I wanted to do this early to make sure that y'all had the video ready uh, so you'll have your Bible study. Uh, we will continue to move forward. We won't stop regardless of COVID-19 or whatever else. Uh, we will continue to go on. These videos are not trying to be your professional quality and all that kind of stuff like that. But y'all know me. I'm down to earth. So are my videos and everything else and the teaching. So just stay tuned. Try to keep it real. Stay safe uh, and all of that great stuff. I love y'all. God bless you. Have a good evening.